Okay, so uh, this will be part of the Raspberry Pi series, uh, part of the diagnostic tool set, sort of. Uh, I think I'm at 12, so maybe we'll make this 13. Uh, so, this has been an interesting experience. Um, I'm going to skip all the long details for the moment. I may come back and give you all those details at the end of the video. But for now, we're looking at some diagnostics here on uh, Dallas Instruments DS18B20 thermal sensors. Uh, pardon the camera here. They are uh, GPIO one wire temperature sensors. Um, so they're hooked in on GPIO pin 4 here using the uh, Pi Easy Connect hat. Uh, that's the white wire upper right is GPIO 4. Then there's uh, a power and a ground coming out. Those are actually connected to the master terminal bus. I'm probably going to change a little bit how that works. But what I really wanted to get at is uh, when you have a sensor going bad, uh, oftentimes one of two things will happen. Either all your sensors will disappear all of a sudden when you go to list them, um, or the other thing that can happen is you get very strange addresses reporting back. This is a perfect example of that. Uh, so you can see I've listed the sysbus w1 devices directory and normally what you'll get is uh, is the sensor addresses as though they were files in that directory basically um, and then you take those addresses and you plug them into your Python code or PHP or whatever you're doing uh, when you read those sensors but uh, I ordinarily am pretty focused on trying to fix the actual problem and I very often don't take the time well not very often but uh, frequently when I'm working on this sort of stuff I don't take the time to go back and videotape uh, what the sensors look like I'm sorry I'm kind of rambling I, I, there's a lot of thoughts in my head here and I'm, I've been trying to sort this out for like two and a half days now and uh, I was quite frustrated I think I've finally figured it out but um so I just wanted to show that you get these weird addresses like this uh, when the sensors aren't working correctly uh, sometimes. And so if you uh, see all your sensors disappear or you get weird addresses like this uh, where you get a zero zero in the front and then uh, a number and a bunch of zeros or a bunch of zeros and a number at the end, <coughs> you don't get like a regular address, which I'll show you in a minute here. Uh, I'll take a clip of... Uh, I'll take a clip of them. But, uh, so when you get that, you probably have a bad sensor. <coughs> and so what I've done, I've been, uh, I basically, I tore apart, <coughs> excuse me, got a frog in my throat here. <coughs> I tore apart my whole uh, screw terminal panel that I had set up here so I could hook everything in through screw terminals. And uh, I'm going to rewire this a little better for now. I just pulled everything out to make it, to do diagnostics. I cleaned up the ends of these wires. I had, uh, extra wires wrapped around and all kinds of garbage that you really shouldn't have with a one wire network and I've gone through each of these separate arrays of sensors and hooked them up by themselves and tested to see that they reported their address reliably and correctly and they did and uh, so I finally got back to testing this one last array that's the one that's hooked up here now uh, again this is ground power GPIO 4 they all connect to the same GPIO, for those who don't know. Um, and it turns out that that's the one that's over here. So I cleaned up, well... I cleaned up these contacts here. This is a lot messier than it was. And so what I'm down to here is one of three sensors went bad. And I'm suspecting very much that is the coil out sensor. That's the sensor that detects when uh, hot water is coming out of the coil, what temperature it's at. Uh, it was just more of a monitoring charting kind of thing. It's not really necessary for any of this. 
Um, but I think that sensor went bad uh, because these two sensors I thought were bad uh, I replaced with brand new sensors and I believe them to be good. I believe them to be good. That doesn't guarantee that they are, but I'm pretty sure. So what I'm going to do next here is disconnect that coil sensor and uh, and we'll see if the other addresses come back. So, uh, actually in interest of uh, showing you how this works, if I can find the clippers, here they are. I'm going to take and clip out this guy, which is the coil out. I'm going to clip out, oh, well, you know, if the clippers will work great. All of, uh, all of the connections to it, just to be extra sure. You probably could just pull the GPIO pin to it, but I'm going to pull all of them to completely isolate it and now we'll see if our other sensors come back up oh, you see the change there see I went from just that one weird address showing up to uh, partial addresses I think this next pass they're gonna show up and I could be wrong. Zero zero a four. Uh, hmm. So maybe one of those new sensors is bad. Very strange. Showing back up again. Uh, sometimes it takes them a minute to enumerate the sensors. So I always do several passes and give it a little bit of time as I'm doing it. You can see what I'm doing here uh, is basically process of elimination. You go through and you disconnect whatever sensor you think might be bad and then you go through and you uh, check the addresses again. I think uh, given based on what I read in the forum, I've done a lot of extensive reading on one-wire networks, as specifically as it relates to GPIO and the Raspberry Pi. Um, I think what I'm going to do is a hard reboot. I know a few of the comments said sometimes uh, a sensor issue like this won't clear without a hard reboot. And when I say hard reboot, I mean I'm going to shut this thing down. Get the mouse hand for here. I'm going to shut it down. And then I'm going to disconnect power for a second, and then I'm going to bring power back up. And again, I apologize for the shaky camera work. It's late. I'm tired. I'm definitely frustrated at this point. And, uh, yeah, lots of stuff. Insert aggravations here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull the breaker to the DC converter that goes from DC 12 volts to 5 volts. So that's the power bus that feeds the Raspberry Pi, the GPIO, the relays, anything 5 volt runs off of that. So now we've disconnected it. Uh, we've let it sit a second. And I'm going to power it back up and you'll see the Pi boot back up here. See the activity light come on. See the raspberries come up. See the boot sequence start. And hopefully in another minute or so, we'll find out uh, if what I think is happening is happening. <laughs> All right, so W1 Bus Master is what you usually get. When you have the interface enabled and don't have any sensors connected, uh, sometimes it takes a minute or two before uh, it starts enumerating sensors. So we'll give it a minute or two. If not, it may be one of those two new sensors. Oh boy, and it may be too, because uh, we got a 008 thing again. 
that is definitely not one of those sensors addresses so we'll give that a second to see if it uh, straightens out and uh, we'll take a look at what normal addresses look like in this uh, text file here it'll open there we go okay so uh, so this is what normal sensor addresses look like. See how these are all uh, alphanumeric? Uh, all mine start with a 28. Uh, there might be one or two that start with a 29, but I think they're all 28 dash something, 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 usually numerical, and then you'll see a couple of letters at the end of the address. So you can see how this varies significantly from, apologize again for the camera work, you can see how this varies significantly from this to this. Uh, so, and we'll go back here and we'll try again. I think maybe one or both of those sensors is bad. Interesting. Alright, so I'm going to disconnect those now. Um, That's frustrating. Those are brand new. That's another set of brand new sensors that are bad. So beware of brand new bad sensors. Don't think just because it's new that it's not bad. It may be bad. Urgh. So frustrating. Anyway, so this is the downside of advanced technology. Uh, my channel, I try to, I try to show it all. Uh, the good and the bad. This is the downside of technology, especially if you build your own architecture. Uh, that means you, there's no service person you can call to fix it. The person you call is you, and that means it calls your time off of other chores and projects. I've been in the process, uh, well, of many things. I've been taking care of a hen that's egg-bound, trying to get her to be able to get her uh, egg-bound egg out and be okay and survive. And uh, I was in the process of propagating a whole bunch of rosemary. I did manage to at least finish the other half of this today and starting seeds and setting up benches. And that's just, uh, that's just farm related stuff. There's a million other things going on in my life as well. So uh, anyway, uh, I know this is a really long video, but uh, I'm hoping that this will help someone because I've been through many frustrations and I think I've come to understand this issue a little better. So now what I'm going to do is disconnect uh, those sensors and I'll hook up uh, a sensor array that is good and you'll see uh, just how quickly that comes up. Uh, so I'll just clip this off for a sec. Okay, before you saw I was hooked on to... Oh, the other one. <laughs> it was... Uh, it was this one I was hooked on to. And so I've disconnected that one. Now I'm hooked onto this one. This one is labeled, it's water. That's the one that goes out and goes right into the T that measures water temperature coming from the ram pump. And so, let's see what we get. Yeah, see? So, uh, just FYI, I don't recommend disconnecting and connecting anything on any electronic equipment without disconnecting all power first. However, I do take that risk from time to time, and this is one of those cases where I did not shut the pie down. I just took the bad sensors off and put a good sensor on. And so you can see immediately we go from these weird addresses, we switch right over and we get a good address here. So I just want to make the point about that for diagnostics. I know uh, when I was doing the reading in forums and elsewhere, uh, I found there were a lot of people trying to diagnose issues with these uh, oftentimes. It's going to be something simple, uh, either power or ground, or uh, the data line is loose or not corrected cleanly, uh, connected cleanly. Uh, other things that can happen if you're running a long lead, I have a lot of long leads in here. If you're running long leads and they run next to power cords, sometimes that can interfere with it too. Uh, you have to remember these are low level digital signals. Uh, so anyway, uh, I hope this helps someone. And uh, I'm going to carry on and try and get these sens the rest of these sensors back online 
and at least get things running again so that I can operate vents tomorrow because we're having warm sunny days and very cold nights right now and uh, this is when I really need it to do its job uh, usually I would have the heat pump transferring heat from this tank to that tank and uh, that would be overnight while I'm stoking the fire and to keep things going and then uh, as soon as the sun comes up uh, it gets hot in here and those vents need to open so things don't fry so I've been stoking on one end and venting on the other end of the day and I haven't had a whole lot of sleep so anyway I'm starting to babble I apologize I hope this helps someone Thanks for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network. Okay, I know I've yammered on a lot tonight. I hope you've learned something from it or helps you in some way. So uh, I isolated it down to, looks like it's these two sensors, or at least one of these two sensors is bad. I'm not screwing with that anymore tonight. Uh, this thermal mass and the heat that's in the other thermal mass is enough to keep uh, temperature, especially I just restoked the fire. And it's currently... 3.19 in the morning, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, close it up. So I reconnected all the other sensors. Um, I had had the power for the relay board through that same terminal set up, so I just made a jumper for now. Later, I'm going to go back and wire that directly into the converter. Uh, eventually, eventually, I'm going to put a 5-volt bus uh, fuse box in like I have for the 12 volt that's really a good way to do that uh, anyway so it's just wired in off the same GPIO connection the gray wire here coming in is the wire that comes in from the Pi hat and feeds power and GPIO to the one wire sensor array um, anyway so everything's hooked back up enough that I can run the uh, vents for uh, for a cooling and I just tested to make sure they were working okay and uh, cooled it off in here fast. I apologize for that light up there. That's a LED light, uh, one of two LED work lights in here that I put on manually uh, when I need light in here for working. Those are solar powered as well off the solar system. I'm babbling again. Point is, uh, when I do the list, you can see... Uh, Let's see, uh, 4 times 3, 12 sensors show up there. Uh, let's see, east high, west high, east low, west low, uh, four ground temperature sensors, that's eight, uh, a water temperature sensor, and a couple others. I'm too tired to list them all. Anyway, they show up like they should immediately, and uh, I'm going to go ahead over to this other window here. You can see I have open... And I'm going to start up the script that controls the vents. And uh, you'll see that it's grabbing temperatures like it's supposed to. Peak I set to zero because that was another sensor that went bad. And you can see that the DC equalizer fan script, uh, fan part of the script comes on. It's a 30 second burst of fan one and fan two, which you can't see behind the light too well. But it's there, I promise you. Uh, those come on and are going. And you can see the red light light up on the, uh, the relay board indicating that those are on. Um, so that's good. At least we have venting now. Uh, I think that's everything for now. I'll do a summary of everything I've been through in the last couple days at the end of this video. So uh, that'll be next. So March 27th, uh, just a quick clip here. You can see on the bottom of the chart, uh, we're not showing the last 24 hours. We're actually showing the last few days. That's because we haven't been logging. And you can see all those straight lines and those weird disruptions on the chart uh, indicating where the sensors started to go down. You can see where sensors came back for a moment uh, last night uh, over here. And then uh, we're down again until I did all that uh, wiring stuff upgraded that I just showed you and explained. Uh, Alright, I guess uh, next I'll do a summary of all that happened as accurately as I can. So I've just reconnected the stove sensor. I put a brand new uh, shielded uh, wire in. 
Uh, my friend Ted brought me a whole spool of this stuff that he got from a dump or something, I think. This stuff, real nice stuff. Uh, two wires inside and a ground shield uh, with a fiber reinforce. Nice stuff. So thank you, Ted, for that. Greatly appreciated. Anyway, uh, so ran a, a new wire in here. Uh, just pulled all this other stuff up out of the way. Those are all disconnected for now. And uh, connected up here. And this is the uh, old stove sensor that's been here for, I don't know, three years now, I think. Um, hooked it back up. And, uh, well, let's see. You can see uh, the previous uh, sensor um, check. There were 12. Put the stove in and uh, shows up. And checked again a little while later, still there. So I think that sensor is okay. Knock on wood, gotta hope it's okay. <laughs> uh, so I probably will put that back in the, the script for data logging and all. Uh, it is nice to have the stove sensor, that's a good way for me to have a reference of where the stove is at in its stoke cycle, so that's a critical part of things. Uh, probably not going to hook the BTU thermal mass uh, <clears throat> on the primary back up until I can get some new sensors. I'll have to look into finding a lead on new sensors that are good. Assuming those are bad, I will go back and test those and see what the deal is with them. Um, yeah, but fortunately we're at a point in the season where I don't really need to manage a lot of BTUs. Uh, end of March here, it's March 27th. and. Uh, we're breaking out into spring for the most part, so hopefully no more super cold nights, hopefully. Um, anyway, so uh, that's that, and I guess I'll go back and do a summary next. Uh, anyway, just thought I would share the updates as things come back online and functional again here. Okay, so quick summary of what happened here. I... Uh, just went through a whole bunch of stuff about sensors here on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the DS18B20 Dallas Instruments thermal sensors. They're a digital one-wire sensor. Uh, I was in here doing some propagation on the Rosemary the other night and uh, watching the charts and really enjoying having that right here in the greenhouse. And then uh, it stopped charting and I noticed something was wrong. I went to check into it, I looked and checked for the sensors, a bunch of sensors were down, so I knew I had a problem. Uh, I started diagnosing that. Um, hadn't isolated the sensors yet, but uh, thought I was on my way to that. And uh, so then, I don't know if I mistakenly shorted a pin on that uh, Pi Easy Connect board, uh, or if it went down for other reasons, so I, I can't say for sure. But what happened was the Pi 3B went down, um, and so then I had a bad Pi. So I had a spare 2B around, so I pulled that out. I put that in place uh, with the existing operating system from the Pi 3. Wasn't sure if that would boot. It did boot. Seemed to be functional and okay. I uh, started diagnosing sensors again, and, uh, and I couldn't seem to get the sensors to come up. Um, after a lot of messing around, uh, I suspect that that was not due to the switch from the 3B back to the 2B. Actually, it was a 3B plus in there originally. I suspect it was actually still the sensor issue that I was having. Uh, but fortunately, my friend Dave brought me a spare Pi 3B. I put that in place, and that helped a lot because it's just so much faster. Such a difference in architecture between the 2 and the 3. Um, so anyway, so uh, I went back to diagnosing. I uh, found that I did have a couple sensors bad, uh, took those out of the equation, cleaned up my wires a bit, uh, connect everything back up, and got at least the vent system back online. The uh, primary thermal mass sensors seem to be the ones that went bad. Uh, I'm going to go back and follow up on those at some point and check them. Uh, but for now, uh, those are offline. Fortunately, we're at a point in the season where that's not a huge problem. Um, so, in summary, if you have problems with one-wire sensors, uh, your best bet really would be to disconnect all sensors and then reconnect them one at a time. Uh, my setup is set in kind of a array, so I have to do them in banks. Um, I'm going to do something about how all these connectors come together in the future to make it a little simpler for diagnostics. 
couple ideas I had was uh, put a switch on uh, uh, the ground or uh, data or one of those or maybe both uh, for each sensor or each sensor array at least so you could switch them in and out easily without having to disconnect wires. Um, my friend Aaron and I had talked about it. Uh, Aaron's a <laughs> Aaron's a super engineer, okay, <laughs> electronically and code-wise, and uh, he's he's got some ideas about uh, maybe making a printed circuit board uh, where you could basically run diagnostics on sensors and be able to isolate sensors or at least banks of sensors. Um, if anyone has any interest in that, by all means, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. If you have interest or input. Uh, we may develop and design something, and we may make that available to the public at some point, uh, depending on interest. Anyway, uh, other comments. Uh, let's see. Sensors. Uh, all the older sensors that I had were solid. I could run those in that uh, pot, that uh, thermal mass pot. Um, they would usually run a year to a year and a half. Uh, sometimes that pot would reach boiling temperatures. FYI, those sensors are rated, I think, for about 250 Fahrenheit max. So 212 is definitely high, but certainly not outside of their maximum tolerance range. Um, recent sensors seem to go in a couple of weeks to a month max and I don't know if they're doing a bad job of sealing the case around the sensor as far as water penetration or what um, but um, I'm kind of annoyed with that and kind of fed up with it so I think what my solution is going to be for next year for the new setup I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work uh, bringing a new stove in here and changing a few things around to, to improve things yet again but I think uh, what my solution is going to be is get a piece of copper pipe and hang my sensors in the copper pipe so that the sensors are not submerged in water and then submerge that whole copper pipe array into the pot and then the sensors are only exposed to heat and not water so it's one less uh, troublesome variable to have. So I think that I've covered pretty much everything. I hope that this has been I hope this has been helpful or useful to someone. If you have any questions, uh, don't forget to ask down below in the uh, comment section. I usually answer my uh, my questions or comments in my YouTube videos. Uh, what else? Um, uh, oh, uh, in the description, I will put a few links as far as uh, diagnosing problems with one wire sensors, um, and I might even throw the uh, one wire. A topology link in there as well so you can have a, a good idea of how one wire networks are supposed to be laid out uh, physically and also uh, how to go about diagnosing them uh, both from a textual standpoint and now of course with this video you've seen in a, uh, a practical standpoint as well so I hope this helps with someone thanks for watching the pharmacy seeds network don't forget to like and subscribe